Hello and welcome to the second podcast in this iView series. It comes to you courtesy of the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh, the University of Edinburgh and the generous support of our sponsors. In this podcast we'll be building on the initial base of podcast one where we and the three amigos touched on a number of general issues both past, present and future in ophthalmology. In part two we'll be digging a little deeper into the trials and the tribulations that might lie ahead, particularly in terms of age-related macular degeneration and future pathways of care. So sit back, grab a cuppa, and enjoy this podcast. Incidentally, that's why I suppose AI gets such a bad rap, isn't it? Because all the bad examples are pulled out without any good examples. Um, I mean, if we look to the future and in terms of envisioning the future, AI surely um, must be helpful. Yeah, it will be, but as Tarek said, I think it needs to be introduced in a way that you don't lose a doctor-patient consultation, because that's what I I don't like is happening in macular clinics, especially around the pandemic when we had to see a lot of patients mm. virtually. Is you're not happy, you're not actually seeing the patient have a conversation with them mm. and so they're not able to um, say how they're feeling treatment's going, whether they want to continue, whether they've had enough and also to have an interaction with them, that, that personal interaction that you don't get through a virtual clinic and that's, I didn't go into medicine to like sit in a room looking mm. at scans on a screen and sign them up for more treatment, I wanted to have, I actually do like chatting to patients and seeing them face to face. So do you think that, that interaction is a missing piece? I mean is it, it's difficult to quantify though isn't it? Um, what is it about being here in person, if I wanted to I could reach out and touch Tarek, although he may He knows flinch. there's a restraining order. <laughs> he may have flinched. But what is it about um, the physical space that is shared uh, in the real world as opposed to talking on a video link? I still... How do we quantify that? What does it look like? And what what is it that we miss out on? Well, I think you, you being in the physical presence of you two, you can read the conversation a lot better and read when people are going to interact a lot better than you can do face to face on a computer. So when you're on the computer, you have to put your hand up or just everyone interrupts. Whereas on a virtual meeting, whereas here it's much more enjoyable experience. It is, but, but is that not a problem with the tech? I mean, if you have a VR um, headset, do you not see that at some point, if you envision the future, that will be replicated to as close as a physical interaction. Is this like the meta world that um, is being created? I didn't want to mention that, but, uh, Facebook, but do you not think that is on the horizon, um, or is that again no, something I think, we, I, I think we, we're, I think, and I, uh, I, I, we all, we talk, we talk to our parents. We talk about when they felt the time was best. So I talked to my dad. He says the time in the fifties was best. When I look back, I think when the time in the eighties was best. And there was only these simple ZX Spectrums that Tarek was tapping away on furious in programs. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. But, but, but um, I think there will be a movement of, against screens, I think, in the future. I think it's, it's gone so far now where everyone's interacting with screens. We're on big screens, small screens, medium sized screens, that there'll be a movement against screens. It'll be more about meeting up with people putting phones away and having proper conversations. Yeah. Okay. I lectured to undergraduate optometry students and to be honest I'm astonished that they turn up. Not because I know what you're thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking the same. The thing. lectures are podcast. So it's it's Monday, nine AM and you've got an option of just lying in bed and just seeing it on a podcast or actually physically getting out the oh, and turning up getting on your bike or as Bal would be, you know cycling 20 miles and then turning up in the lecture hall and I'm surprised actually to see that the great proportion choose to actually be there in person, this is younger people. Mm. So I can see what you're saying and I think people will always crave that That's within us, a bit like, deep genetic. Yeah, paper records. So I, I think that, that there is something in that that uh, means that um, we're going to have to somehow replicate it so closely or just decide that it's not worthwhile and we stick 
with the physical interaction. But I think it is important. I mean, with AMD, if we to look at um, the vision of the future, um, we treat the eyeball, and I know, Tag, this is one of your current topics as well as UP, uh, in terms of how we take a, a holistic view, to use that overused word. Um, we don't tend to get a sense of whether somebody is anxious, uh, worried, depressed, on the end of the phone, or in a video link, possibly. Although I don't know, perhaps you can pick up on depression. But depression is very common in AMD. And, yeah. and when I um, hit the time when I possibly may get a diagnosis, I wouldn't want somebody just to be focused solely on my eyes. I'd want somebody to be focused on my well-being, which feeds back to the the doctor-patient relationship. Mm-hmm. So how do we see that playing out? Well, I think it's, these interactions are really important because, again, um, a lot of patients, I think they enjoy the social interaction when they come into the clinic. They're talking to patients outside, they talk to a doctor, and they get a lot out of that. But then it brings into question this AI robots of the future, your robot uh, Tarek giving you your diagnosis and treatment, but no robot Tarek might actually be able to empathise with you as well and, and talk to you about your depression. So that's the way Is that what you do, doing. Tarek? <laughs> <laughs> He's putting words in your mouth. No, I like that. Yeah, keep going. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I think, going back to what we said earlier, we need to try and make tech work for us so that it's doing the things that we're not necessarily good at, you know, um, and we're left doing the things that we will always be better than technology at, such mm-hmm. as human interactions and looking at uh, patients holistically. So a patient might come into a clinic of the future and the AI system will say, you've, you've got diabetic retinopathy, but it's, uh, it's severe, but it's not needing laser treatment at the moment and review in three months. It will do that from the imaging scan and some basic demographic data. But that same patient saw uh, a human, they may notice that actually the patient arrived a bit late and um, was smoking away and kept looking at his watch and mentioned uh, at the beginning of the clinic that he found it really hard getting to appointments. That's something the AI isn't going to be able to pick up on anytime soon. And those human factors could be the difference between that patient uh, having laser or not. In this case, the physician might decide, actually, this patient is not is probably not going to be a good attender. Then thinks, oh, I'm going to look back at the old notes, and actually, yeah, he's not been, he's missed, mm. you know, so many of his appointments. And all of a sudden, you've got a completely different output. The AI system wasn't wrong, but there are a whole set of nuanced things that a human can... Um, help can can deal with that the AI couldn't and so there's lots in the research world about exciting things about AI replacing clinicians in terms of looking at an OCT scan and seeing is this active AMD or not I think if we had a straw poll of physicians at the moment definitely in our hospital and we said I'm going to develop an AI system it's either going to be mean that you don't have to flick through the OCT and decide if it's active or not or it will get the patient's notes up, it will get the right notes up, it will deal with all your data entry, it will get all the historical OCTs up so you can see them, and then input what you think into the EPR without you having to do anything. I think 99% would choose that, mm. rather than a system that looks at the, even though it's not as sexy uh, to be standing in, a, or it's not going to make the front cover of nature, that's actually, I think, what we need at the moment. How far away are we from that, though? Because well, the the moment, te- I've got an, a, 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 an EPR that's the, eight weeks in. That's, the, uh, well, the technology, I think, is there already. You know, we, if we, we're looking at our systems on a mobile, we, if we're on a mobile phone, uh, babies can use them and, and tablets. The, the, the user interface is so intuitive and it's designed. Uh, to allow people to do things very quickly. That was the. It's made to look simple, but it's actually had you know genius behind it to make it do that. And I think that's the trick that has been missed in the hospital EPR systems that we've not realised that even though we've got very clever people in hospitals, they still need a very intuitive interface. You don't want to have an uh, an EPR system and then. A hundred slide PowerPoint presentation telling you how to use that API so, system, so which is where, what we've got at the moment. So where's the gap between uh, what we've got at the moment and what we need? So why hasn't 
I mean, it would seem pretty simple if you've identified the need, then you should be able to then identify a way of getting there. So where's the gap? Is it because we're not collectively telling um, partners in um, uh, computer-based tech and AI what we need uh, is the problem that they have a product that they then try and give us as a profession that may not be fit for purpose. Well, why is that gap would seem so obvious, glaringly obvious, but why isn't it being addressed? I don't know if I mean, I think if I knew that, I would yeah. be in my villa, you know, very rich. spending that hundred yeah, yeah. million. But Elon Musk. <laughs> well, <yeah. laughs> okay, so we've identified the problem. Why can't we just go to one of your network of folk? Um, and you are very well networked and connected and say this is what we need but is it because we're too shy or self-effacing I'm not as optimistic as Tarek because I think that you will still need the the part of the data entry I'm just thinking for example checking a vision in a clinic you can't automate that really because you have to have someone to make sure they're checking the vision properly using a pinhole correctly that they've got the correct glasses on you need a human for that you need a human to write down a bit of vision you need to get someone to enter that that vision into a, an EPR system. So all these things, you know, uh, like uh, you know, the, the AI is simple. AI isn't, it, yeah, be. no, but the AI isn't going to know that the patient's smoking. It's only you asking the patient. Yeah. But you have to end your hands with that. So I think yeah. you know this is wishful thinking. Yeah. That, well, I think so. In the US, I think some. Uh, I think user interface could be a lot better, much better. So at the moment, with my old. Uh, EPR system might have taken five clicks in uh, mm-hmm. in the macular treatment centre. The new one takes fifteen, oh. so there's much more. And then the second thing is that in the future, perhaps we should be having scribes. Mm-hmm. So just like when you go to the dentist, like and, and the that's a nice like, thought. Like Who would the scribe be? Like, like, like the Jonathan Dr. Glaucon Fleck in her own scribe. Yeah, they do. In, in, yeah, maybe we should have scribes in this country. So you're saying trainees should act as scribes. No. <laughs> no, I think scribes should act as scribes. Yeah, it's a more efficient way of, uh, of, of running out clinics. Okay, yeah. so um, I'm not feeling very much more confident than at the outset of this discussion. You still want to come to mind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're going to be in a bit of release, apparently. Um, so maybe I'll come out to the south of France and, uh, and join you. But, but I, I think... Um, there are definitely bits of the jigsaw puzzle that we as a group can identify that could be um, usefully filled. And certainly, uh, you mentioned, Pete, um, vision needs to be tested and that data needs to be entered. A patient can test their own vision. Tarek. No, but they can't, Bob, uh, because if they... The majority, uh, majority probably could check it out, but you'll get... A reasonable number of patients that don't check it properly because they haven't got the right glasses on, they don't have to use a pinhole, or they look through their fingers, or you know, there's so many variables that can go wrong with checking a vision mm. that I think it's wishful thinking to think. And, and, then, and then, if one part of your data is incorrect, one, one set of your patients is correct and correct, then you, you, know, you can't rely on any vision that you're getting through. So that means home monitoring really is not going to be possible. But with it not, yeah, home monitoring and OCT, I think, might be a possibility if, if it's... That's really curious, so, so that's with more the vision, like but vision, it's so subjective that, you know, it's not worth it. What do you think, Tarek? I, th- I, think, I think assessing vision is a lot harder than it sounds. I agree with you on that. And you'd be surprised at the how unreliable vision testing is, even in clinic, mm-hmm. where we found it, especially in AMD, to be very unreliable. But there are some interesting um, apps and uh, developments going on. I know Oco Health is doing a lot of really interesting work at the moment, and people are developing vision testing. It may be that the physical examination is, is just found to be more objective. Um, and home OCTs are being developed. We're working on a system in Manchester which might be cheaper but involves retinal imaging. (laughs) 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 But I think we we, we will need some form of home monitoring because with longer acting AMD agents, people not come to clinic as much and we know the other eye can suffer even just for that reason uh, alone. 
we need to at least try it. Even if we pick up, even if we have uh, agents that are sensitive but not necessarily specific, it would help in in that realm of things. So I think it's worthwhile to carry on trying, but it is it is a lot harder than it uh, than it might sound to mm. to have that think vision based um, monitoring. So when we think about these long wrapping drugs that are coming out at the moment, mm. uh, for, uh, with regards to th- the uh, port delivery system, do you think that's uh, a goer at the moment? Um, yeah, it's an interesting um, topic because uh, about 15 years ago, I was working with some engineers um, on um, the a prototype for a port delivery system uh, that uh, was fascinating because it involved engineering, um, microfabrication, ophthalmology. Is that the one where you have to carry a satchel on your bag and there's uh, a pump? <laughs> it, it, was, it was a gold, gold foil and you, 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 probably, you probably haven't read the paper, I'll send you the PDF. Um, um, Quite heavily cited, oh, sorry. Yeah, but sorry. no, I don't. I certainly don't want to blow the trumpet on that. But but it's something that um, logically would make sense, but uh, logistically it still involves invasiveness. And you've just heard about my reluctance Pretty to nice. have uh, an injection, let alone somebody put an ocular equivalent of a rucksack um, strapped to uh, the uh, the eyeball. Uh, but uh, it does mean that um, again we're we're just trying to predict the future based on reinventing the past if we have the paradigm of a drug well let's give more of it over a longer period of time by using an ocular rucksack I just have to remember that's not bad for your next next pattern copyright (laughs) Um, uh, then surely we're moving away from taking uh, people as individuals at whatever stage they are in life and whilst I'm probably a little bit older than than you guys uh, we're all going to get there the date of birth uh, model is creeping up on us all um, it will, surely it'd be far better to try and predict those people who are just the analogy being the smoker mm-hmm. rocks up in clinic surely we should be we're telling people to stop smoking surely there should be interventions modifications behavioral or otherwise that would enable you to prevent getting to the point where you need an ocular rucksack this symposium is sponsored <laughs> by, by nutritional <laughs> supplements <laughs> <and> by <laughs> <laughs> well you've done a lot of work on nutritional supplements yeah. um, Pete you're very interested in breaking the chair yeah. and uh, nutritional supplement but now I'm, I'm um, more thinking of uh, uh, a paper sometimes I read papers and they get stuck in uh, a neural circuit this one's on the retinal age gap have you come across the retinal age gap do you read current journals aside from iNews <laughs> and occasionally the BJ okay so um, it's uh, out of the UK biobank um, Oh, I might be an author on that one, actually. You're, you see, yeah. So it's a paper <laughs> that you are an author on that you can't quite recall. Um, and uh, and what it uh, what they did to uh, to make a very long story very short is ascertain um, at a single point in time somebody's retinal health based on AI uh, interrogation and um, their uh, what their biological um, retinal uh, metrics should look like and they derived that gap, hence the name retinal age gap so if you were to walk into a clinic at, um, if you're late 50s early 60s and uh, you had a, a picture taken of your retina they would say well your age gap is not looking good you better do something about it, either losing weight mm-hmm. or stopping smoking or doing Listen. something else. No, no, we're all very spelt. Um, surely that should be the public health primary care um, area of research that should enable and empower individuals to 
reduce their risk of getting to the point where they're needing an intervention, whatever that, that may be. I think we have to be very careful about some of this. I think I vaguely remember that picture. <laughs> but I think you we have to be very well, careful yeah. um, about taking papers which show, for example, associations or correlations um, into the real world, because a lot of the work uh, I've done on trying to develop, for example, image analysis systems or image processing systems, it's relatively easy to show an association, for example, with uh, vitreous um, detached fried air. No, vitreous, let's say, uh, uh, white areas and vitreous with the level of uveitis. That's crazy, and there's lots of papers to show you can do the image analysis, and, and people who have more of these white areas have got, are also the ones who've got very severe uveitis. And you can show the correlation, and that's the paper. But actually transforming that into a clinically useful tool, which is going to be sensitive and specific, is is can be often a really big gap. And then with AI as well, um, it's all it's called the AI chasm. That there's a big distance between demonstrating something in a research paper to then being able to demonstrate it in an external validated studies to then have um, it. Uh, approved by regulatory bodies and the funding that is needed to have that mm. to then implement that and audit it to then uh, have and the training needed for physicians to be able to understand how to interact with the AI because if you can imagine you you could have an AI system which said a patient in front of you has got active AMD but you're looking at the scan and thinking I, I don't think they have mm. the system says it's 80% confident and you're like well I, I, how do I so you are looking we, inside in, inside that black box but, but we do it um, even without AI I mean Pete if you see somebody whose retinal age gap might be glaringly obvious they're 40 for example and they have drusen at the macula um, you're thinking to yourself that's quite early to have uh extensive soft drusen yeah. so in a way you're um, latching on to that concept of what they appear to be at that point in time at their particular age and whatever advice uh, and information you give them actually what inv- advice and information would you give them a 40 year old with bilateral soft drusen okay, all, the, all the healthy lifestyle advice that you would normally expect to give someone that age. You don't sound like you're convincing me. <laughs> but you really believe in why it. Yeah. It's because you can give people all the advice under the sun, but I think that very few will actually follow through. Um, on, on but is that, that true with, with the up-and-coming generation who carry Fitbits? Um, none of us carry a Fitbit or they're monitoring their various parameters, whether it's steps. Yeah. Um, you probably monitor your own yeah. steps. But even uh, compliance with medicine bow is very poor. So we're talking about people complying with health, health advice, I mean, everyone knows to exercise, eat healthy, lots of green leafy vegetables, lower your cholesterol, but very few people do. But is that because they're not confronted with um, their own retinal image yeah, but and what it's telling you or know, telling but, but the patient? It might last a day, say, so, oh, well, here's your retinal age gap, you know, you're ageing faster, but I, I, I think it's wishful thinking to think that many people... I mean, people quite often they're confronted with their own bellies every morning <laughs> and they still don't. Yeah, Pete, we've been discussing this earlier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But they are I mean, confronted with that. But, smoking but, under but, but surely that's an important component of... Um, we talked about the value of human interaction and the doctor-patient relationship. Yeah. The missing piece is addressing that behavioural need because without, uh, you can take diabetes as an example where somebody may well need to lose weight um, and reduce their blood yeah. pressure because there's a very stark example of them being able to see and you yeah. show people pictures of background diabetic retinopathy. But there are things that we... I think are convinced yeah. about that um, by extension if you have further data or insight um, or a prediction model that you would then that, and that, that in, a, in a way would drive research just as we've identified gaps mm-hmm. in a, an EPR or an EMR that have yet to be filled surely that 
those are the important questions that need to be addressed through research. Mm-hmm. I'm still uh, kind of a bit negative about the fact that you can really make much of a difference. Mm. I mean, the idea is that you've got to motivate people to make he- health- healthy lifestyle changes. But as we've seen, the obesity is an increasing problem in the country. Type 2 type diabetes and is an increasing problem. People know they shouldn't eat uh, unhealthy foods. They know you should get more exercise, but people don't. So, I well, think... Well, I think... Yeah. Um, yeah, that is a fairly pessimistic view of the capability of, of human beings to look after themselves because increasingly that degree of uh, behavioural change will be, and we're doing it all the time, it's the reason that uh, you like to go to the gym and you like to swim, although I don't know when you were last in there, or it's the reason that uh, you eat healthily and you don't smoke, it's the reason sadly you drink iron brew that maybe you should take to um, yeah, eating foodstuffs about. that are useful I like iron brew you know, <laughs> and the thing is, is you know, and I know it's probably completely unhealthy for you but you know uh, you've got to live a little too ok um, so I think in terms of uh, range and scope and breadth of coverage we've got uh, through quite a few elements of the visions of the future but let's um let's just wrap up uh, by saying um, about research which i was trying to encourage you to uh tell me your thoughts about um quick question who should be doing it who should be funding it and what is important to do in order for me to be if should I ever need it be a happier patient with AMD care 20 years from now Terry so it's difficult to uh, I think wrap up in sort of a short period of time I'll try (laughs) I think the whole model of research should be changed from the way it's funded to uh, the way papers are written and the cost of getting publications uh, to the sorts of things researchers have to do to the sorts of things to the sorts of people who do research. My ideal would be that if a clinician who's an expert in his field has a good idea that he's passionate about, and this is the way things were you know, hundreds of years ago when really innovative stuff was actually being done. If you if you read experiments, this is of, of if you read the original paper by Harvey even, the sorts of intelligence William. and the yeah that were going on were really interesting. The things that would, would never be able to happen now, because here was somebody who was really fascinated by something and didn't need to spend a year getting networks and getting grants and then having to go through ethics and then having to go through the setup process I feel like sometimes the 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 challenges in getting a research project done are so onerous that it can only be done now by the by a really small group of people who almost have to do certain forms of research that they may not necessarily be even that interested in, but which are the ones that will get grants and get grants approved and get higher impact papers. I'd like to see a situation where whether you're in the north of the country or the south of the country or in a big teaching centre or in a smaller centre, if you have an interesting idea and something that you think is useful, even if it's just something that's innovative and that might not work, you can somehow get access to do that without it being uh, so onerous that it would completely stop you in its tracks. Alongside the big projects that are being done, yeah, a lot of really good work is being done at the moment, but I just feel like some of the people trying to do innovative stuff and might be passionate about something are being squeezed out by the the challenges there are uh, in academia at the moment, which can be quite... Uh, yeah, they're daunted by the prospect. Pete, what so I'll be a bit briefer than that, but I agree wholeheartedly. I agree with that. So I think that um, the problem is a clinician full time doing clinical ophthalmology is you have ideas, but to actually have find the time to do a research product or to investigate what you want to, even the ethics process kind of uh, is so daunting that 
that it puts you off doing it. And I think there should be a means whereby uh, maybe a, a group of clinicians around the country can get together and come up with all their interesting ideas and then one or two, two people like Tarek, with, maybe with more research on their hands, can take those ideas forwards. And I'm not going to do your ideas. I'm not going to do your ideas. Find people more who are motivated, who have the, have the time, to, because as a clinician at NHS, there really is very little time to do any um, uh, unless you yeah, want to your whole life to it. It's a shame. And, and there are, I'm sure, there's lots of good ideas out there which aren't being done because people put off the whole process because the yeah. time that's needed. And they don't necessarily need to be groundbreaking in nature. They could be really important, but just be a small, a small thing that you've seen and noticed in your clinic actually could have relevance to other people and other patients. And, and they have the, the biggest impact, um, just noticing that you've got 15 clicks instead of five. A fantastic basis. Uh, for a project, but uh, it could be like a, an X factor for research ideas, and you pitch your ideas to uh, like maybe a, a group of uh, top research clinicians, and, and they go with the top one or two ideas. I like it in, it, in a song format, yeah, perhaps a karaoke of sing your idea to them. Of research, that, yeah, yeah that, that that could take off. So um, we're I'll, running I'll out. Practice without our hard take on me. Okay, well, we'll, uh, we'll take on your project. We'll wait for, for that, <laughs> complete with accent later. But, but it's been a, a delight and a pleasure. I've got one, I want a one word answer to wrap up. Um, we, I could go on talking to you guys for, for hours and hours. Um, I want a one word answer on what makes you happy. Tari, one word. Presence? No, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> Uh, family at the moment. Family. Pete. I can't copy that. I mean, who's, who's watching? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The outdoors. Yeah. Family oh, and the outdoors. Yeah. Well, that's two words actually, mm-hmm. Pete. But um, we'll have the uh, rather than the outdoors. Uh, and England winning the World Cup. Well, okay, you go. Coming home. You go. Yeah, it's coming home. Well, we could have a supplementary yeah. question. If you had two tickets, uh, would you take me or Pete? I'd, I'd probably take choice. my son. Oh, no. no, no that's, <laughs> that's a very diplomatic answer. Because your son might, might click onto this in 10 years' time. Who knows? Anyway, thank you very much. It's been fantastic. Could talk to you for hours. Really enjoyed it. Thank you very thank much. You. Thanks. Thank you for watching the first podcast of Three Amigos in this iViews series commissioned by iNews. Brought to you courtesy of... Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh, the University of Edinburgh, and through the generous sponsors who have supported us. In the next podcast, we'll be taking a different perspective, the eye view of the patient. I'll be talking to Malcolm. He'll be telling me about his experiences and his take on what's happened to him during his journey as a patient with AMD what his aspirations are for the future, and I think in terms of providing insight into the sharp end of being a patient and on the receiving end of intravitreal treatment, he provides us all with information and a unique perspective on what it's like to be a patient. So I look forward to seeing you then, and goodbye.